I don't know about you guys, but for the last couple of weeks, my newsfeed has been full of stories about the movie The Creator. But since I'm a filmmaking nerd and the algorithm gods know that, the stories aren't focused on the plot or the acting or any of the normal person stuff. Instead, they've been feeding me articles about how this $80 million movie was made with a $4,000 camera, which is actually exactly the same camera I'm using to film this video right now, the Sony FX3. Now, we all know that the FX3 is a great little camera and one of the best mirrorless cameras on the market for indie filmmakers and content creators. That's nothing new. But using it to film a movie that looks just as good as anything I've seen come out of Hollywood in years, that one took me by surprise. I mean, you can literally buy this camera over the counter at Best Buy, and in my opinion, that's a complete game changer for the future of independent filmmaking and documentary production. Though maybe not for only the reasons you might think. So in this video, I'm gonna break down how they were able to use this prosumer camera to achieve Hollywood level results, how they rigged the FX3 to get the most out of it, and why I think this is a big deal for indie filmmakers and creators. Then at the end, I'll get into how I'm gonna be rigging my FX3 moving forward to turn what I thought was gonna be just my YouTube slash Bcam into a cinematography powerhouse. To be honest, when I first heard that they shot the creator with an FX3, I thought, that's cool, but I already knew the FX3 was a powerful little camera after using it heavily for the last two years. The more I thought about it though, the more I realized that this was actually kind of a bigger deal than I first thought, and now I can't stop thinking that this is actually a really important moment for modern indie filmmaking. Copy, thanks. Copy, thank you. If you need proof that I'm actually a working DP, uh, that was a radio check-in to make sure that all of our safety protocols have been met for the day. So I'm up in the Canadian Arctic actually filming a TV show and I hope people appreciate uh, how much goes into actually making a YouTube video sitting out here in the snow like an idiot. But before I get into why I think this is a big deal and what it means for filmmakers everywhere, let's spend a minute talking about how the creator used the FX3 and how they built it out to get Hollywood level results. When these articles first started hitting my feed, I guess I kind of assumed that they would have built up such a massive rig around the tiny mirrorless body that it would be pretty much the same thing as a standard cinema rig with so many accessories and mounts that the FX3 would be nothing more than the brain at the center of a giant Frankenstein rig. And maybe that did happen sometimes, but as I combed through the internet for BTS pictures, it actually looks like they didn't do all that much in terms of modding, at least by Hollywood standards. Now, I'll never really know what happened on this set, and only the DP and the crew knows for sure, but from the pictures I could find online, it looks like, at least some of the time anyways, they used a pretty basic package. In these pictures, it looks like they're using the FX3 with a wireless follow focus, an Atomos Ninja 5 monitor or Ninja V, uh, a Koa 75mm anamorphic lens, and then mounting the whole thing onto a Ronin of all things. On the back of the rig, it looks like there's a larger battery for more power, and then probably some sort of Teradex system for wireless transmission, but apart from a burly top handle to hold it all together, I don't really see that much else. Now that's not to say that they didn't have bigger versions of this rig for different kinds of shots, and I've actually heard rumors that they had five different configurations on standby, depending on what they needed in the moment. Now I'm not totally sure, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that at least some of the time, they were shooting an $80 million movie on a package that can be ordered same day shipping from Amazon, apart from the anamorphic lens, obviously. And if you swap out the lens and use a less high-end follow focus system, this whole package package could conceivably cost less than $10,000, which is absolutely insane when you consider that a fully rigged out Alexa package probably costs about that same amount per day to rent. Now, I've also heard rumors along the lines of this being all a marketing stunt for Sony and that really the Alexa 65 was used for a lot of the film, but I don't really think that's true the more I read about it. The main DP, Oren Soffer, and also Greg Fraser, who helped out with some of the film, have been quoted as saying that they wanted to use a small camera to reduce the crew size and that the low light performance of the FX3 meant that they could also shoot without lights, which further reduces the need for gear and crew. Because even though the film cost $80 million, they didn't actually have enough money to shoot in all the locations they wanted without cutting back. And at the end of the day, even though it's a ton of money, it's really only a medium-sized budget by Blockbuster standards. And all right, maybe you're saying, so that's all well and good, but why does any of this matter for you and I? 
we're finally getting to a place where gear is no longer the obstacle to great filmmaking. And while this has kind of been true for a while, it's also sort of been not true in other ways. Like, I know they shot that movie Active Valor on Canon 5D Mark IIs like 10 years ago, and there's other examples over the years where smaller cameras have been used to shoot great movies, but not in a movie like this. This movie is ridiculously epic looking, and even though I haven't actually seen it yet, it looks gorgeous. To shoot something like this on gear that I'm using to film this YouTube video is just insane to me. And if it worked here, then it stands to reason that more and more professional level productions are gonna relax a little when it comes to the kind of gear being used, which means that as smaller indie filmmakers, we aren't kept out of the game because we don't operate Alexas or Reds. Like, maybe we're getting close to a time when you don't actually need to put a huge matte box on the front of your camera to convince clients that you're professional because you can just say, this is the same movie they shot the creator on. I know it's not going to happen overnight, but this is an exciting step. It also means that we can't hide behind the excuse of not having the right gear because if this movie shows anything, it's that story and experience matter a lot more than the camera. And yeah, I know that there was a lot of post-production and set design and all sorts of CGI that makes this movie really pop, but they also didn't shoot on green screens or on massive sound stages. For the most part, they shot on location with a lot of natural light augmented by LEDs and then animated the CGI stuff on later. So while you might not be at the level where you can paint a massive futuristic building on a mountaintop in Nepal, you also don't need a 10 ton lighting truck and a six person camera team to make something look amazing. Now what does matter is your story, your level of experience, your vision, and your eye. Now luckily that's something that's in our control and it's something we can work on with practice practice and dedication, and that it's possible for people in a variety of economic situations as well. So even if shooting on an IMAX camera or buying an Alexa Mini is way out of reach for most people, we can still get better, we can develop our eye through practice, and we can prioritize telling stories over using technical tricks to create a spectacle. For me, as a documentary-focused cinematographer, that's very, very exciting, and I hope it's also exciting for you too. I mean, this video right now is being shot on an FX3, and apart from the anamorphic lens, I pretty much already have everything they use to shoot the creator and for me that's really inspiring and makes me just want to get out there and make beautiful work instead of saving up for a Sony Burano or Venice or something. So let's finally stop saying things like I'll make my film when I can afford camera X or if only I had Y piece of gear I could make something great because if the creator shows us anything it's that these are now hollow excuses. <laughs> shot the creator on a new camera, it's a Sony camera, it's called it FX3, um, pretty much the whole movie shot on this. Um, it's a camera you can buy at Best Buy, yeah. um, it looks like film, um, it's full frame, full IMAX resolution, and has filmic, like, really photographic quality to it. It can shoot in moonlight, and as a result, it meant that we didn't need big massive lights, so given that I already have an FX3, but so far have just used it as a YouTube camera and a B cam for interviews, what are my plans for it moving forward? Like, am I gonna use it differently or start building it out in a different way, or maybe even using it to replace my FX9 as the A cam on shoots? The answer is both yes and no. But first, how do I rig out mine right now, and how will I be changing that after seeing what the crew and the creator did? Well, I've had my FX3 for about two years, and I ordered one within a few months of it being released, and for the most part, it's got everything you need to shoot right out of the box. The top handle with two XLR ports makes it the first mirrorless camera that I've owned that can actually be used to follow characters because I can run a shotgun mic and a lav at the same time, and now with the firmware update, I can also run proper timecode, which means I can incorporate it into multicam shoots. When I shot my short film highlight, Line and my first feature film this summer, uh, I shot a lot of scenes using both my FX9 and my FX3, and it was really easy to sync them in post. So I didn't really have many complaints, but there were a few modifications I made. The first is that the top handle isn't long enough, so I added an extender from Condor Blue that makes it a little beefier and a bit easier to grab onto while also adding a bunch of extra mounting options. Now, it doesn't look like they even used the top stock handle in the creator, which makes sense when you have a sound recordist on set, but I consider this extender, almost an essential modification for me anyways, because it makes the camera so much easier to carry around. It also means that you can attach a monitor to it a lot easier, either with magic arms or NATO rails, and that fixes my only other real complaint with the camera. The flip-out LCD is great, and I love the touch autofocus in some situations, but if you're shooting a 4K Verite scene, it's not really big enough to be relied on. There's quite a few times when I've been positive something is in focus, only to get it offloaded onto a computer and realize that the focus point was off by just a little 
little bit. And when you're shooting in high resolution, like we all do these days, it's really noticeable. The Creator guys use an Atomos Ninja V or 5, which I think they picked not only because it's a decent screen, but because it also allows for external 422 ProRes recording. For me personally, I haven't felt the need to use an external recorder because even for the highest budget documentaries I work on, the standard 4K codec is usually more than enough. It does make sense that the Creator crew would want the ultimate quality possible, and you might want that too if you're doing like really high-end commercials or narrative work, but in my opinion, most normal shooters don't actually need this. I'm not saying it's not nice, but even for the biggest budget docs I work on with $10 million plus budgets, it's kind of overkill. Feel free to disagree with me in the comments though. As a monitor and focus tool though, I think this would be a great choice. I personally use a small HD 502 Ultra Bright because I think it's just a little bit more rugged and because the super high brightness is important for me working outdoors. But if you don't shoot in really rugged environments like I do, I think the Ninja V is a great choice. That said, when I shoot with two cameras, the small HD goes on my FX9, and after seeing the Atomos used here, I'm thinking of grabbing one exclusively for use on the FX3. I've said a couple times on this channel that cheap monitors are a total waste of time and money, like the Andy Cine monitor that I gave away after a couple weeks of use because it made me so mad. And if you don't want to spend over two grand on something like the small HD, the Ninja would probably be a perfect choice, and I think I'll end up investing in one myself. And even though I don't really plan to use the recording features, I guess it's good to know it's there. In terms of the Ronin, I have mixed feelings about gimbals. I do like them, and I have a Ronin RS2 Pro that I use from time to time for specific shots, but for most Verite dock shooting, I actually prefer a more organic handheld look. Everyone has different tastes here, but for me, it seems more natural and real, and I don't really like the look of gimbals in documentary scene coverage. If you need one for something specific, like a sequence of someone running or driving or whatever, then they're amazing, but I personally won't be keeping mine permanently mounted on a gimbal like they did. And when it comes to the question of whether or not I'll be using my FX3 over the FX9, the truth is that sometimes I already do. Now, I'm not gonna lie, the FX9 is a better camera in some important ways. It has a Super 35 mode, which allows me to use a lot more lenses. Uh, the ergonomics are a bit better for shoulder shooting, which is my preferred style when filming docs. The variable ND is insanely helpful, and if you really pixel peep, the footage does look better. Though that's not so important these days because all cameras look great. But the FX9 is a lot bigger, more intrusive, and when doing things like filming in cars or hiking long distances where weight is an issue, or when I film in very low light, the FX3 steps up from B cam to A cam. So, am I gonna be switching completely? Well, short answer, no. They're different cameras and they excel at different things. To me, they're not really meant to be compared directly, but as a pairing, they cover each other really well. With that said though, if I didn't already own the FX9, could I work with the FX3 only? 100% yes. With a bit of modifying like the handle and adding a bigger monitor and maybe a larger battery for more power, I could totally shoot a full film on this camera alone. I definitely miss the shoulder mount form factor of the FX9 and I'd really miss the variable end but there's no reason this couldn't be the only camera a serious documentary shooter needs to tell an amazing story. Because if the creator has shown me anything, it's that story and vision count for a lot more than the camera body. We are in an amazing time for filmmaking where a $4,000 camera can look like 80 million, and that's something I'm really excited about. So the takeaway for me is that it's time to stop making excuses and use the gear that you have. Just get out there and make stuff because waiting until you have the perfect camera just doesn't really make sense anymore. Anymore. I'm curious, have any of you seen the movie yet? Let me know what you thought in the comments and if it changed your view on cameras at all. I'm obviously still up here in the Arctic, so it's kind of unlikely I'm gonna catch it in theaters, so I'm kind of relying on you all to let me know. See ya.